action, adventure, special effects. These were the trademarks of Star Wars. Now, filmmaker George Lucas has turned his attention to an area that has long fascinated moviegoers, monsters and creatures. In Return of the Jedi, the Star Wars galaxy is occupied by a menagerie of creatures, the likes of which have never before seen the light of a movie screen. A star monster, Jabba the Hutt, an intergalactic gangster who lords it over a wretched hive of scum and villainy. He's not unlike the monsters that frightened early moviegoers, if not Douglas Fairbanks. He's in the tradition of King Kong, a creature that scaled the heights of movie history. Movie creatures like E.T. and the Muppets have helped us realize that there are other worlds to wonder about, where creatures like Kermit and Miss Piggy can be wise, charming, and irrepressible. Some even have their own hang-ups. The motion picture camera has made it possible for us to encounter creatures that have never lived, except in someone's imagination. In the Star Wars movies, we actors have had to work alongside the bad, the ugly, the cute, and the cuddly. We've worked with green rubber puppets, giant fur balls, and gold plastic robots, and more recently with a giant slimy slug. Star Wars is the land of the Ewok, the Wookiee, Yoda, Jabba, and C-3PO. But these creatures would have had remained so much plastic and foam rubber if it weren't for the artists who built and operated them, giving them the spark of life. Unlike the movie monsters and creatures of yesterday, today's species can walk, talk, and blink their eyes and even wiggle their noses. They're capable of showing a wide range of emotions because of articulation engineers. Big words. Big guy. I wonder if Miss Piggy knows he's walking around loose. Some creatures inhabit our dreams and nightmares. Some come to us directly from the movies like this character, Salacious Crumb. He is only one of over 60 weird and strange creatures to emerge out of the fantasies of the men and women who work here at the Star Wars Monster Workshop. In the movie, he plays Peter Lorre to Jabba the Hutt's Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> he sits at his blubber ship's right hand and gives people like Carrie Fisher's Princess Leia a pretty bad time. Who's that guy? We have powerful friends. You're going to regret this. And a closer look at Java and his film predecessors. In the third and final chapter of the Star Wars saga, the three cosmic musketeers are back, leading the rebellion against an empire that has so long held the galaxy in its villainous grip. The young Jedi Knight, Luke Skywalker, along with Han Solo and the feisty Princess Leia, once more challenge the dark power of Darth Vader. As usual, at their side is Lando Calrissian with C-3PO and R2. But this time, in their battle against the Imperial Stormtroopers, they have a new and surprising band of allies, the Ewoks. From the filmmaker's imagination leaps a simple creature that provides not firepower, and not exactly manpower, but a teddy bear-like power, sufficient enough to topple Vader's mighty forces. Teddy bears. 
When George Lucas began to work on the Star Wars trilogy over ten years ago, no one suspected that an endearing little creature, something like a teddy bear, would play such a large role in bringing about the defeat of the Empire. Not even George. Well, he always planned that the fateful battle against the technological might of Vader's forces would take place on and around the green moon of Endor. But he thought the inhabitants of that moon would be Wookiees. Like Chewbacca. Chewy to his friends. But Chewy evolved into a sophisticated creature. What, Chewy? A co-pilot and a master mechanic. He was no longer the primitive that Lucas wanted to crush the Empire. Chewy was too intelligent. Well, most of the time he was. Chewy? Great. Always thinking with your stomach. George had to develop another primitive. The original concept of the Ewok was that he'd be short and small, sort of a short version of a Wookiee. And uh, Joe Johnston and uh, Phil Tippett worked on designs, I think Nilo worked on the designs also, of, of um, you know, these small creatures. The original designs were much more human-like, little men. And I wanted to get away from it looking like a man in a furry suit. I wanted it to be a creature unto itself. And in evolving that, more and more fur got put on, and uh, the eyes got bigger, and uh, he became more, more animal-like. And uh, we realized that he was getting to be a very cute creature, a very teddy bear-like creature, which first we fought a great deal, but eventually we dared to be cute. There were 123 different sketches of Ewoks before the final design was chosen. Once physically defined, the Ewok had to have a language. Sound designer Ben Burt experimented with several African and South Pacific languages before he established Ewokese. Come on, sit down. I promise I won't hurt you. Now, come here. No. All right. You want something to eat? Body language was equally important to the character of the Ewok. It had to move as if it were still unspoiled by man's scientific advances, like an animal. Come on. Hmm? I'm on my feet. Inside the Ewok suits are little people, dwarfs and midgets. Plaster masks were made of some of their heads and all of their hands and feet. Latex skin and fur transformed hands into Ewok paws. An attempt was made to articulate the jaws and eyes of some of the creatures. mouth and jaw movements were experimented with. Latex masks, later covered with fur, became one part of an unusual six-part suit. The head, the body proper, fitted over a sculpted foam rubber frame, two hands and two feet. But building Ewoks was sort of like putting a bicycle together on Christmas Eve. Stuart Freeborn discovered they did not work the way he planned. Along with producer Howard Kasangian, he was faced with too much roly, too much poly. Overfurred and overfoamed, the Ewoks found it difficult to move. Freeborn had to redesign the Ewoks' feet, making them softer, more flexible. And in order to keep the costumes from becoming unbearably hot and to prevent the eyes from fogging up, Freeborn ordered a hole drilled in the Ewoks' head. It's all quiet. You... Over 120 little people responded to the original Ewok casting call in London. Some applicants were rejected, being told for the first time in their lives that they were too tall. <gasps> what is it? Look, look, it's, be surprised. You've really got to act it out. <gasps> and hide, hide. All right, now run to each other. Run to each other for help. All right. The shortest Ewok was under three feet. The tallest was just over four. The youngest was only 11 years old, the oldest 67. 
Among the 70 Ewoks cast were a dock worker, a civil servant, a sales lady, and a typist. Because whatever you feel inside, no matter that you've got a, a big costume on like that with all that padding, it shows through. What you feel and think shows through on your face. When studio filming was completed in London, the company moved, on location, to the giant redwood forest outside Crescent City, California. Here, even Kareem Abdul-Jabbar would feel tiny. I stay on the ground. For a few weeks, the California forest was transformed into the green moon of Endor. The Ewoks, costumed in Robin Hood-like headgear and vest, which both added character and hid sags and seams, prepared to do battle against the Empire. The ears? No. All that was needed to put the Ewoks into motion was the word from director Richard Marquand. Action! Push him along faster. I got one. Ewoks one! Two! The 130 Imperial troops the Ewoks were working with and fighting against were hired locally. They were mostly out-of-work lumberjacks. In Return of the Jedi, the Ewoks helped fulfill one of George Lucas's fantasies, a primitive culture using only natural materials, like stone and wood, to destroy a technologically superior power. Clearly effective and highly original, the Ewoks are the simplest of all film creatures. They are men in suits. Actors in costumes, like Shakespearean trained Anthony Daniels, who plays C-3PO, and Peter Mayhew, who plays Chewbacca. Some of the more classic film creatures are also just men in suits. Oh, I'll go down and unfasten it. In The Creature from the Black Lagoon, actor Rico Browning plays the fearful, fanged missing link. Actress Julie Adams plays beauty to the beast. Another memorable man in suit monster is Godzilla from Japan. Here, an average sized actor in costume slam dances his way through a miniature model city of Tokyo. Film monsters can also be created by using real live creatures, like these lizards in Journey to the Center of the Earth. Dressed up and made up, they are photographed to appear like prehistoric giants. In Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, special effects genius Ray Harryhausen created yet another kind of film creature. The colossal monster on a rampage is a miniature clay model, photographed one frame at a time, and later superimposed onto a live action scene. The end result is a mean looking monster who's not fussy about his diet. Motion photography and special effects also created the most famous miniature monster of them all. Willis O'Brien's artistry transformed a malleable clay figure into King Kong and made us feel not only sorry for him, 
but glad that he wasn't an air traffic controller. Another way filmmakers create monsters is to build them the actual size that they want them. These they operate mechanically, like the giant ants in them. Another mechanical creature from the movies, R2-D2 from Star Wars. When actor Kenny Baker is inside R2, it qualifies as a man in a tin suit. But mostly, it is a mechanical, remote control. R2! Action! Come on, come on! Even though R2 is nothing more than metal, wiring, and paint, and can communicate only by emitting electronic beeper sounds, he emerges as a somebody, a person we can laugh with and cheer for. My goodness! And when he gets zapped, we can feel his pain. Oh, why did you have to be so brave? Oh. Some monsters, sometimes the most ferocious of them, are simply hand puppets, like the Rancor in Return of the Jedi. Described by his designer as a cross between a gorilla and a potato, the Rancor began as a clay model. Monster maker Phil Tippett and George Lucas first made sure Rancor had the look you wouldn't want to know better. Next, a metal skeleton was constructed and then covered with the latex skin. Before painting, remote control elements were implanted to make it possible for the creature's fingers to grasp his prey. The hand puppet head completed the creature. It takes three operators to bring Rancor to life. One man directly manipulates the head. Another works the hands by cable control. A third puts Rancor in motion by propelling his legs, which are attached to extended metal rods. To complete the Rancor scenes for Return of the Jedi, two sets were required. The Ranker puppet worked alone in a miniature cave in the Monster Workshop in California. His prey worked alone on a full-size stage outside London, England. When the separately shot scenes are combined, it's hard to believe Ranker is only 18 inches tall. The pig guard was merely an appetizer. The Ranker is determined to have Luke Skywalker as the main course. <laughs> the Rancor is a classic monster. Like a dragon, he lives in a place where usually only spiders go to die. And he engages in mortal combat with a dragon slayer, a Jedi Knight. But Luke, like the knights of another day, survives. <laughs> Once a filmmaker's creative mind is unleashed, you can never be sure what will be sitting next to you. Odd co-pilots in Star Wars. I mean, Han Solo had a Wookiee, and Lando Calrissian flew with a what? A creature with a face like a halibut? The fleet commander, Admiral Akbar, is a cross, I guess, between um, a lobster man and the creature from the Black Lagoon. A good creature, Akbar. Proof that ugly is not necessarily bad. Now this guy, he's ugly and bad. <laughs> Look what he did to C-3PO. Not my eyes, Artu! Help! Quickly, Artu! Salacia says he's depraved because he's deprived. But some creatures have accepted and enjoyed the way they look. Enough of this serious talk. I'd like to regale you now with... Oh, I'm ugly, I'm ugly, yes, in. 
Cause beautiful's out ugly in. If you're ugly like me, you're in good company. Cause there's millions of us who are ugly. At the Industrial Light and Magic Workshop outside San Francisco, George Lucas and over 140 people began in 1980 to design and build not only ugly, but bizarre creatures for Return of the Jedi. More than 60 alien creatures were built in six months, many of them being charged with life by cables, sacks, bladders, and pipes. With so many roles in the movies being played by creatures, it was necessary for the creatures to be able to act. Admiral Akbar, the rebel fleet commander, is a case in point. If he was to fulfill his mission as a believable leader, he had to communicate urgency, concern, and commitment, and he had to do so from behind inches of latex and cables. Articulation engineers, headed by Stuart Ziff, constructed a mask for the Admiral that provided movement of eyes, eyelids, nose, and mouth. Off-camera technicians, viewing the actor's performance on video, helped the characterization with an eye blink here, a raised eyebrow there. Still, to achieve the desired credibility, there were two versions of Akbar. One for wide shots, and this one for close-ups. From the nearby moon of Endor. Here, puppeteer Tim Rose, who plays Admiral Akbar in the movie, works painstakingly to put mouth and words into perfect synchronization. Penetrated. 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 Pen. No ship can penetrate it. And action. Because Tim Rose's hands are busy inside Akbar's head, another puppeteer is added to operate the creature's hands. The closer these creatures came to operating like people, the more people were needed to operate them. Another filmmaker who works in this technique is Jim Henson, the creator of The Muppets. Hanson co-produced and co-directed a film with nothing but creatures called Dark Crystal. What's it for? Hmm? Hmm? Is that what you want to know? You want to know what this is all about? Suns! Stars! It takes scores of off-camera puppeteers watching TV monitors to choreograph the movements of the few on-camera creatures. Eternity! The very gingulous of time! How else would you know conjunctions? Hanson, who works some of the key creatures in the film, talks about giving his actors character. With puppets, a puppet generally you're working symbolically. A puppet is a symbol of whatever you're trying to portray. And so therefore, if you have an evil character, it can look totally evil. Design gives the monster its first character trait. The actors inside or operating them give them their nuances and shadings, whether crude, rude, or disgusting. The co-director and collaborator on Dark Crystal is also the man behind Yoda, the Jedi Master in the Star Wars saga. Frank Oz is the puppeteer and the voice of the 900-year-old cosmic sage of the Dagobah system. It is Yoda who imparts the wisdom of the Force, to the young Luke Skywalker and the Empire Strikes Back. Hmm. Adventure. <laughs> You're sacred. <laughs> Every Jedi craves not these things. You are reckless. I won't fail you. I'm not afraid. Yeah. You will be. You will be. Frank Oz is Yoda, but he's also the persona of the most nubile, the most sensuous, the most well-rounded performer ever to grace the silver screen. Frank Oz is Miss Piggy.
Salacious is proud to know that, like himself, Miss Piggy is a kind of puppet. And welcome to Puppets Talk Back. Um, it all started about eight months ago. There I was, just an idea in somebody's mind. And then, today, poof, life. It's kind of magic, you know? I've got a detonator in my hand. <laughs> the magic of Salacious and of all hand puppets <laughs> is in the hands of their puppeteers. <laughs> The magic of yet another creature that has captured the imagination of the world goes beyond the manipulation of its operators and designers. E.T., like the best of movie creatures, has imposed himself on the world's imagination because of the message he brings. The magical E.T., designed by Cholera Baldi, is so strong a character that he is able to communicate his message of love and innocence, even while hidden underneath a Halloween costume. In Steven Spielberg's film, E.T., the friendly alien left behind on Earth is befriended by a young boy. On one fateful walk, E.T. discovers our fascination with strange and wonderful creatures. Yoda and E.T., proof that the classic creatures of the movies can touch us all. Otto, are you sure this is the right place? When C-3PO and R2 passed through the giant gate of Jabba the Hutt's palace, they entered a dark and mysterious world where once they might have encountered a single terrifying monster. Now, on what is actually the set of Jabba's palace, the two droids discover a cavern full of bizarre and gruesome characters. It required hundreds of support people to service Jabba and his band of illegal aliens. Each creature represented a different culture and spoke a different tongue. They did, however, have two things in common. They all suffered from the heat, their costumes became fur-covered saunas, and they were all called by strange-sounding names. Re-yeast, Toothface, Squidhead, Bubo, Six Six, Hermioodle, Yak Face, The Toadstool Terror, Rock, Wart, Nikto, Weeba Weeba, Ulan, Woof. I worked with all those creatures, had lunch with them, let some of them borrow my hair dryer. It sometimes is hard to believe that most of them were just so much aluminum tubing, steel rods and pipes and vinyl air hose. At times they could really get to you though, give you the creeps, give you the feeling that maybe they could bite. Biting was a favorite pastime of the earlier film monsters. occasional timeouts for tag team wrestling. Creatures from the early cinema took bites out of whatever they could sink their teeth into. And if they weren't biting, there was always the ever popular monster mash. Some, like the giant peeping Kong, misbehaved because he was misunderstood and would give you the once over. Or the twice over. Or the third. And fourth over. Not all film creatures are enemies. Some are allies, like the Tauntaun in The Empire Strikes Back. The inanimate miniature Tauntaun was put in motion by the then-bearded Phil Tippett. Tippett was originally a special effects wizard. He helped bring Star Wars creatures to life by photographing them one frame at a time. 
making slight adjustments of the creature before each shot. Tippett put the powerful dragons and dragon slayer into motion by refining this craft. Utilizing a computer which moves camera and creature simultaneously, the new technique called Go Motion makes the creature seem to move more fluidly than ever before. After Dragon Slayer, Tippett drew the assignment as Chief Monster Maker for Return of the Jedi. With a little help from his friends, he was in charge of designing, building, and caring for the motley crew. This included the gargantuan job of packing and shipping them from their home base in California to the sound stages in England. Hey, say, does anybody know what the in-flight movie is? Oh, I hope it's Raiders. Ah! Tippett, Stuart Ziff, and other monster makers built some of the costumes of the creatures in the film to fit themselves. They thought they might have to join Chewbacca and the Ewoks in front of the cameras. Give my regards to Princess Leia. Old friends, and some not so old friends, accompanied them on the flight. Work began on the first of the creatures in June, 1981. Six months later, they were off to work at L Street. Work was to attend to and amuse the mighty Jabba. Among those who toiled to please Jabba was an outrageous intergalactic rock and roll band. The lead vocalist was Miss Snooty. She was backed by Droopy the Reed Man and a keyboard man who is the blues. That's real good. And down you go, Billy. Basically background, Max Rebo's band became an unusual focus for George Lucas. They're just some, a whim that George has really pursued and has seemed to really be interested in and has a lot of fun with, although they occupy one line in the script that says something like, and then the band started up. I feel my heart a pumping. Ooh, oh, oh. Lucas instructed that the vocalist have her own number. Composer John Williams wrote the music. His son Joseph wrote the lyrics. For the film, the song would be translated into Hutties, Jabba's language. Miss Snooty is a complex combination of Rod Puppet and Marionette. She owes her most outrageous feature to George Lucas. I went in to see the first mock-up of her. And she had these little teeny lips, and I just, it just occurred to me, wouldn't it be great with the end of this long snout of these giant red lips, Mick Jagger lips. For close-ups and synchronization, Miss Snooty becomes a hand puppet. Gives <laughs> me, gives me. Miss Snooty is not only a classic creature, but a classic party animal. She pleases Jabba, she entertains him, but finally Jabba entertains himself. The most sinister of creatures, Jabba is also the most technologically intricate of all those on the Jedi set. He is the ultimate creation. Carrie Fisher as Princess Leia got as close to Jabba the Hutt as anyone. The 18-foot-long gangster with runaway hormones took a liking to her and a dislike to Luke Skywalker. Master Luke, you will bring Captain Solo and the Wookiee to me. Jabba is unique as a film monster, not only in the way he was built, but in the way he acts. He never stands up, for instance, but he does stand out. <laughs> Jabba doesn't do anything. 
He doesn't pluck airplanes out of the air or tear down elevated trains. He just oozes mean. I mean, he's bad. I didn't envy Carrie Fisher. As an actress, she had to figure out how to play off this undulating mass of blubber. Let me ask you something. How do you have a meaningful relationship with a three-ton slug? I don't know. I, I don't think I'll ever be disappointed in the way he looks. He is what he is. That's the thing. He doesn't pretend to be anything else. He doesn't feel the need to be charming or anything. He's just an unpretentious, very straightforward guy. And I love him. Jabba may be an alien creature, but his cinematic ancestors include some sinister humans. I mean, he's based on all the sort of uh, evil Sultan-like characters. You know, the large... I guess Sidney Greenstreet would be a good example, and, and um, Marlon Brando would be a good example in The Godfather. It's, uh, there's, there's always been the sort of uh, rotund, evil Sultan who sat on his bed while people were tortured in front of him. Over 76 sketches of Jabba were done before designers got down to making clay models for George Lucas's consideration. We started off with this design for Jabba, which is basically a real sluggy, wormy creature. And George took a look at it and said, nope, not that one, it's too terrible. So we went to another version of Jabba which is a much more humanoid sort of thing, the forearms. And he said, nope, too human, try again. And we ultimately ended up on this character, this very fat, slug-like creature who looks like he needs a lot of assistance from his entourage. With the final design approved, the task of building Jabba fell to Stuart Freeborn at the London studios. Freeborn, who also built Yoda, considers Jabba his greatest creation. Jabba was conceived as a giant slug. His tail would have to partly communicate his character and emotion. What may seem simple was actually a complex and complicated mechanical feat. The process for building Java included clay models, plastic castings, and intriguing interior frames. With the tail finished and ready to slither, Freeborn and his assistants tackled the head, putting in tiny air sacs to make the outer skin bulge and move when Java smiled. It's when you do smile, when you do that, that function really does swell out there. It should be a fat. Maybe we haven't got the fat. No aspect of Jabba's anatomy escaped freeborn scrutiny. Right. Okay. As any actor knows, detail builds character. It should be fatter than that. Saxophone-like paddles and valves were placed under Jabba's skin. Remotely controlled, they worked with the air sacs to bring Jabba's face alive. But Jabba would be able to arch an eyebrow, wrinkle his forehead, express anger and suspicion. Freeborn wanted Jabba to act. It took two tons of clay and 600 pounds of latex to form Jabba's incredible hulk. One of the largest problems was baking the clay mold for Jabba's skin. An entire room had to be transformed into a giant Jabba bakery. Next came Jabba's eyes, the mirror to his evil soul, and one of the keys to making his performance come alive. Lucas wanted Jabba to have eyes that could react to the light. The irises had to open and close. The pupils would have to almost instinctively react to what was happening around him. The demands Lucas placed on Jabba's creators pushed them to their limit. But producer Howard Kazanchin and the monster builders finally delivered to the set on the first day of shooting was a fully developed three-dimensional being. Once the finishing touches were added, Jabba took his place center stage with the other actors. Jabba was alive, not only because of the men who designed and built him, but now because of the men who operated him. I do Jabba's right arm, 
and his jaw. Um, with the jaw, I do the, the lip sync with the, the voice. <laughs> now, this is the middle part of the tail, and this little bit is the little end piece, which the way I move it depends on the mood he's in at the time. If he's in a, a, a bit of an irritable mood, I just do the little flips like you bang. Each of the operators had small television monitors so they could see what they and their partners were doing to Java. Give it a good old thrash on like that or backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And if he's in a lazy mood, you just keep it like that. Steady movement. I'm Java's left arm and uh, that goes in here and my right hand is free inside the head and uh, basically works this head control tipping it left and right front and back and up and down i have one other control that can swivel the head revolve it and uh, for certain shots i have things like the tongue here three men were inside java one below him these two controls here are the nostrils left and right this one here controls one corner of the mouth, and this one's the other. Two others operated the eyes and eyelids by remote control. And then he sees him after that line. Dying. The director talked to Java's interior operators through a microphone. And I need a laugh from you at that point. A big, mean laugh. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, do you understand? Great. One. On a movie set, there are many ways of communicating. Six different people operate Jabba from six different vantage points. They must each do different things, yet do them together. Jabba must undulate and ooze as if he were just one being. Where's my talk drive? It's a little like patting your head and rubbing your stomach with six different hands. Okay, now look down and put the frog in your mouth. Frog, let's stick it in your mouth. Right. Cut! For the first Star Wars, an earlier version of Jabba was planned. He was cut from the film when George Lucas decided he wasn't bad enough. This Jabba had no problem being bad. Here he proposes a monstrous treat for Luke Skywalker and his friends. He has decided to feed them to Salak, a hungry and avaricious desert pit monster. It's the last mistake you'll ever make. The fictional Salak resided in the desert waste of the twin sun planet of Tatooine. Actually, it was part of an extraordinary outdoor set built in the Buttercup Valley, near Yuma, Arizona. Here, Java's 60-foot high, fully rigged anti-gravity sail barge would loom over the execution of Luke Skywalker's crew. Once devoured, Luke and his friends would die a slow, painful death being digested inside the stomach of Sarlacc for a thousand years. The Sarlacc was nothing but a giant monstrous mouth. The frightening orifice was built over an underground room rigged with special equipment to break the stuntman's falls. Luke Skywalker and his friends decided not to become part of Sarlacc's menu. Jabba's creature hitmen are no match for Luke's lightsaber. Get the gun! Point it at the deck! Once more, the young Jedi Knight overcomes the enemy and manages to Come rescue on. the girl. For Luke Skywalker and friends, Jabba and Sarlacc Let's are go. just bad memories. For others, they are something more, 
part of a movie creature experience that they'll never forget. Creatures in today's movies are not only special effects, they have become special events. Science and technology have advanced the art of today's creature movies. But like Star Wars, the best of them succeed because they celebrate the human spirit. The little guys like Luke Skywalker and his strange assortments of creature friends win, not because of magic, but because they believe in themselves. That belief provides the kind of power that makes it possible for young women, like Princess Leia, to rescue young men in distress. Don't move! I love you. I know. Hands up! Stand up! <laughs> you know, the magic of the movies in Star Wars is people. What they do on the screen and what they did to get it there. It's the magic of the designers, creators, and builders of our favorite movie monsters. It's the magic of the operators and the actors, like Toby Philpott, David Barclay, and Mike Edmonds, of Tim Rose, of Little Warwick Davis, of Frank Oz, of Peter Mayhew, Kenny Baker, and Anthony Daniels. It's the magic of make-believe, of the men and women who could call upon their imaginations to help us imagine what life was like in other worlds, at other times, in galaxies far, far away.